Welcome. Welcome to our first lecture of this um, semester. My name is Betsy Gardner, and I am the president of this wonderful organization. I'm going to be standing up here before you every lecture to give you announcements as well as to tell you, please turn off your cell phones. Please. So my first announcement, um, I regret to say that the um, tour that was described in the brochure uh, we were going to go to Justin Morrill's home. We're not able to get that together, and it's been canceled for this semester. Channel 17, the handsome man in the aisle is <laughs> filming, and they hope to take every one of our lectures and then um, broadcast them on their TV channel. And so you can tell your friends, people who um, don't have the pleasure of being here in person, they can listen to and watch the lecture. Today, I want to introduce Bjorn Nordstrom. <laughs> Bjorn is our new AV technician. And he is the project manager at a nonprofit uh, by the name of Technology for Tomorrow. Now the salary that Bjorn receives from us does not go in his pocket. It goes to fund and provide technology education program for um, refugees and immigrants through the uh, collaboration with the United States um, Committee on Refugees and Immigrants. As Bjorn has said, this represents the very best of collaborative partnerships. We are very happy to be part of it. One last announcement, and this you've heard over and over. It's my pitch for volunteers. Uh, our new publicity chairman is Dorothy Lovering. She's looking for folks to resupply libraries and other venues where we have distributed our brochures. If you have a few minutes every other week or so, it doesn't take long, you stop in, see, carry some brochures, please see Dorothy or me after the lecture. We would um, really appreciate it. And now Beth will introduce the speaker. On behalf of the program committee, welcome to our fall semester. We hope you'll enjoy the series of presentations that we have planned for you. And we have as a kickoff today uh, a returning speaker that we're very happy to welcome back, Pablo Bose. Pablo uh, was born in Calcutta, India, and he grew up in Vancouver. He uh, attended and got his, earned his bachelor's from the University of British Columbia, his master's from Simon Fraser, also in BC, and his PhD at York University in Toronto. In 2006, he came to the University of Vermont, where he is now an associate professor of geography and also the director of the Center for Global and Regional Studies. His current research focus topics include refugee resettlement, so it's very appropriate today, uh, environmental displacement, and transforming cities. And he's here today to talk to about us about contemporary India. So welcome back, Pablo Bo. Thank you very much. Excuse me before you start. Yes. Could you please arrange or have someone adjust the recording for television so that those who are actually here can see you? Ah. Um, I mean, I can try. I think I'm going to be blocked some way. I could just move around. I'll try to do that. I'll move around. Uh, okay. uh, so I wanted to thank you. I sound. Feel like I sound really loud. No, no, no. 
Um, so I wanted to thank you again for inviting me to come and join you. I really enjoyed my opportunity to come and speak about a different element of my work, as was just mentioned, which is on refugee resettlement. And I actually remember your organization, I think, coming and speaking at the RiskNet meetings, the Refugee Immigrants Connect. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's really great. So, um, But today, I'm really excited to come here and speak to you about another topic that uh, is very near and dear to me, uh, both in terms of my research and my own uh, sort of personal life, which is looking at India today. There are many, many, many things that um, I could focus on in talking about India today, and especially in terms of this um, this set of challenges and opportunities, what's going on um, in the country today. I'm going to look at only three. Uh, I could certainly look at some of the really pressing issues around sexual violence uh, and women and children, um, around uh, kind of broadly understood climate change and the floods in Kerala. Many of you may have been uh, seeing on the news uh, the dust storms in, in the Northwest, um, all sorts of things that have been going on. Um, across the country. But I'm really going to look at three particular things. I, I realize I have 45 minutes, and um, so I'm going to try and stick as much as possible to, to little chunks for these three particular issues. And I'm going to start off by showing three images, uh, and I'd like to get your sense of what you think these are pictures of, just to, to figure it out. So the first is this. Um, it doesn't show up particularly well, but uh, any guesses as to what this is? Big Ben. Yeah, Big Ben. Picture okay. of Big Ben. A big Russian apple. Yep, that's about right. And this. An angry monkey. Somewhere along the lines of an angry monkey. East German car. East German car. It's actually a Baruti Suzuki, which is a. It's a uh, joint venture between an Indian car company and uh, Suzuki Motors. Um, that is correct for all three of these images. Um, however, they're not per perhaps in the places that uh, we might expect to find them. Um, and they might mean different kinds of things. The first picture is indeed of Big Ben, but it's a reconstruction of Big Ben in the middle of a highway in Calcutta. <laughs> so when I got off, so I, I, I'll show you some images in this, um, in this presentation from the trip I took to India in March of this year, which was my first time back in a few years, um, and it was the first time with my wife and my daughter, uh, and with my in-laws, um, so we had so it was a big uh, kind of extravaganza. But one of the first things that uh, greeted me as I got off the airport in Calcutta was this monstrosity. And I sat there and I thought, why is Big Ben in the middle of a highway? It doesn't even, it's not even a tourist attraction. It's literally in the middle of a highway in Calcutta. When we went to Goa, I was confronted everywhere with Russian. And was trying to figure out why, is, why are all these signs in Russian? Why are hawkers uh, actually speaking to tourists using a few Russian words? Um, they all assumed that my mother-in-law is Russian, and not exactly um, And the third image is, uh, is this image that all through, uh, especially northern India when we were in Delhi, we saw images of this uh, again and again and again, this angry monkey, uh, this stylized angry monkey. And, you know, for my, my daughter, who was five, this was very excited. For, and, you know, and my in-laws and my wife didn't really understand what it signified. To me, it was very clearly a symbol of the Hindu right. It's a very aggressive, nationalist symbol. Uh, it's something that you see, uh, along with the colors, very much uh, in the streets during uh, demonstrations, but more and more as a way of kind of marking or branding. It is not as aggressive as what one might find with some other kinds of symbols, but I think that it's been uh, been used in different sorts of ways to identify who one is and what they sort of believe in. So the three things that I want to talk about today are these three sort of big issues that, um, that grip India in many different sorts of ways. The first is globalization in Indian cities, and really why it is that a Calcutta would build not only a Big Ben, but the current prime minister or uh, chief minister of the state of West Bengal 
of which Calcutta is the capital, wants to build an entire waterfront that mimics London. She wants to build the London Eye. She wants to build uh, a whole range of these different symbols. The second thing I want to talk about, um, to some degree about Russia, but really more about China, uh, is about geopolitics and real line world and India, its place in it. And the last thing which sort of ties all of these together in different ways is the rise of Hindu nationalism and of the sort of militant Hindu right, um, something that is uh, not new, but is a sort of profound particular moment of a kind of populism. We're seeing other sorts of populism all across the world, and I want to talk about this particular one. These are all issues that I've worked on in different ways over uh, many years, as you heard, I was uh, born in Calcutta. My family left when I was uh, 12, and I grew up in Vancouver. But I returned to Calcutta many times uh, as a researcher. I did my PhD research looking at the transformation of Calcutta itself. Uh, in 2015, I wrote a book called Urbanization and India? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that about right. The 11 people who read it. The 11 <laughs> I wrote this book called uh, Urbanization and, and India, and really looks um, very much at people like myself and what our relationship with India was. One of the things that um, is really notable across the world, not only in India, but in all, many, many different countries, is the ways in which people who have immigrated abroad um, participate. They feel this connection to former homelands. And in my case, I was looking at how they were being sort of drawn back into um, rebuilding of these cities. And even if they weren't, the sort of lifestyles that we were supposed to embody uh, were kind of transforming the cities. So I'll talk about all of those um, in different ways. So the first thing uh, is really to talk about the ways in which cities are changing. When I first went back to India as a researcher, I was going to look at population displacement from big projects. I was going to look at things like dams, and railroads, and all these, these projects out in the rural uh, areas. But what I really saw that just astounded me, well, first of all, the, the different organizations I was going to go work with said, yeah, we don't really care about that. What we really want you to look at is, how are the cities changing? And the landscapes of the cities are uh, astoundingly different. Uh, Bombay, which I went to in this last trip, when my uh, aunt and uncle moved to Bombay in 1970. The population was about 4 million. Today it's about 17. Um, so you have this massive change. Even when my, uh, when my parents lived in Calcutta uh, in the 1930s and 40s, um, uh, then the population was somewhere around 5, 6 million. Today it's around 14. So you have these significant uh, rise in population, but you also have a fundamentally different kind of city. Now that had been happening, you know, it's not like this has just started in the last 20 years, but what's profoundly different in the last 20 years is the nature of that change. For a large part of its sort of post-independence history, um, from 1947 onwards, India was in a, at least in name, kind of socialist development model. It wasn't socialism, really. But, you know, a lot of central planning, a lot of supposedly rational projects, things like that. But over the last 20, 30 years, as especially the India has kind of surged ahead in the new global economy, especially the sort of IT economy. There are these wholly new kinds of development in the Indian city that you see all around that are kind of fantastic. There are ways of imagining futures tied very much into that global economy that look very, very different. So you have these growing and modernizing cities all across India. I mean, a city of a million is not, not a big city. You, know, you have these mega cities, and then you have the state of Uttar Pradesh alone has, what is it, 300 million people uh, living in that, um, in that state, and many, many of these large cities. Um, what you've seen is, while cities have been growing, and this is true not only of uh, India, but of, of the world as a whole, this is, the first time in the history of the world that more people live in cities than live in the countryside. But what we've actually seen is that while the pace of cities has grown, the pace of slums has grown faster. So while cities across the world are growing at roughly 4% a year, slums are growing at about 8% a year. 
So this kind of informal growth, which has all kinds of profound implications, um, is really, really good. So we've seen increasing inequality. Um, I'll just give you one really quick example. That before India joined in 1991, it really joined the capitalist economy um, much more fully. It took IMF loans, and changed the whole structure of its economy, engaged in neoliberal um, you know, sort of transformation, all these kinds of things. And one of the things was, when the British controlled India, one of the big things that undermined their legitimacy to rule was that there were these recurring famines. So if you're a big empire and you're saying, well, we're going to take care of you, and I won't get into all of the sort of racist frameworks around that, but if you're a big empire and you're saying, we're going to take care of you, and yet you have these recurring famines where millions of people die, um, that really undermines your legitimacy. So when the, the British left and India becomes independent, one of the first things the government did was they created this surplus of grain and other uh, food commodities. So if there was a famine somewhere, they could redistribute them. That remained in place till 1997. And in 1997, as the Indian economy was transforming and you know, IT was everywhere, they decided, we have all this surplus grain. We should just open it up to the export market. And they did. And what you see now, um, agricultural economists have estimated that between 1947 and 1997, caloric intake as a measure of, of, uh, of nutrition was rising across the, uh, the Indian country and the Indian population. Between 1997 and 2017, um, ever since they opened this up to the export market, this has just gone through a nose back. And we're back to the uh, types of things. So increasing inequality is a really, really big issue. And yet at the same time, if you go into Indian cities, what you see overwhelmingly is this evidence of a new kind of luxurious um, building. In many ways, it mimics the playgrounds of IT campuses, you know, the Googles and the, the Facebooks in North America. So this is the, the campus of Infosys, uh, which is one of these massive global, um, what they call business process outsourcing. When people talk about outsourcing, there's always this imagining of manufacturing, and there's, there is that. But a lot of it is actually things like financial services and other kinds of services. So Infosys does a lot of this. Uh, I couldn't find an actual phone anywhere on the campus. I found this phone booth, in which you're supposed to use your cell phone. Um, but again, it's, it's this sort of fantastical set of images. This is their cafeteria, built to look like the Sydney Opera House. This is their, the communication center, uh, built to look like the roof. And this is part of the entrance to the um, uh, the campus, and what's really interesting is, so all of the workers there, they call this the washing machine. I don't remember what it was actually called. But what was fascinating was when you cross this bridge, they didn't allow uh, photographs inside, but when you cross that bridge, sorry, this is in the city of Bangalore, um, which is very much at the hub of the IT uh, world. Uh, you cross this bridge and it says on one side where you're looking in, uh, there are sign, uh, there's uh, letters from a uh, quote from the founder that says, this is the future. And on the other side, you look out and you see the sort of dusty landscape of the old town and it says that's the past. Mm -hmm. And that's very much this kind of notion of uh, we're moving towards this, this greener future. Um, there's, I think, 80,000 people who work on this campus. Uh, the city as a whole has upwards of 3 million people living in it. And it actually looks specifically onto the slums. Now, Bangalore, as I said, is very much one of the cities that's at the, the heart of the IT uh, revolution uh, in India, but Calcutta is not. Calcutta, at one point, was the, the capital of India, but that was a long time ago. It's ever since then been mostly noted for its poverty. You know, the born into the brothels, the city of joy, all of it. It's been, for a lot of urban theorists, it is the example of urban decay. It's an urban disaster everything goes wrong. And yet it too has undergone this kind of remarkable change over the last number of years. It's rebranded itself, it's marketed itself as being something new. And all over Calcutta you see uh, images of this. 
So this is the sort of Calcutta I grew up remembering. This, this reminds me in some ways of my grandparents' house. But as you see right beside it, we all already have these sort of gleaming new structures that are coming up. You have an old um, city that is trying to very self-consciously rebrand itself as new. One of the things that the city council is trying to do is ban rickshaws. Because there is a, a sense that, well, this gives people an impression that we're old. We see here the classic Calcutta car called the Ambassador, um, except that wasn't built in the 1950s. It's a retro car that was built last year. And we see new cars sort of choking the streets all around. The chief minister of the, um, the state, as I said before, who has this Bengal means, means business uh, campaign, she's the one who wants to build the London Eye and the, um, and the, the Big Bend. Because for her, if you want to be global, you have to be London. And it's, a, it's an interesting, different way of thinking about this than other places that say, see New York uh, or Paris or Tokyo as an example of what is to be modern, what is to be um, part of the globalized world. Um, shopping malls dominate. It's a massive, massive shopping mall. Um, and you know, I always feel very conflicted. Um, for me, going back to India as a child was always uh, terribly uncomfortable. It was hot, it was dirty, it was um, just a real sort of sense of privation, whereas now you can, if you are able to, access spaces like this, these massive new malls, which are um, sort of a cultural phenomenon as well as just a place to shop. Global brands, so we hear more and more and more, um, so we have Starbucks everywhere. Um, and uh, these new buildings sort of dominate this, the uh, landscape. So the old city on the left here and the sort of rising city uh, on the right. Um, but all of this is done not through any kind of central planning. It's not as though the city sort of sits down and says, well, we're going to build all these new uh, apartment towers. Where are all the cars going to go? Where are all the people going to get the services that they actually want? Um, and this is especially apparent on the eastern fringes of the city, where we see massive new building projects. This is actually true if you look at much of India, in Goa. Uh, Goa was very much a sort of sleepy seaside set of beaches. It's now massive building projects everywhere, and Russians everywhere. So we'll get back to that. Um, new metro lines. Um, and these metro lines, highway overpasses, they're meant to bypass the old city if you have a car, if you can get into the metro, uh, and so on. New building projects, it's like a city of skyscrapers all over, um, including a Trump Tower. Uh, although, I think they're suing the Trump organization. <laughs> they stiffed them on the money. Anyway. Um, but really, I want to finish off this first part by saying, you know, there are many different kinds of impacts of uh, these massive new building schemes. Um, many things. Uh, you know, there's been more and more, as I said, inequality, and more people are displaced as a result of that. Um, and just on the sort of environmental front, this is what the old um, eastern fringes of the city used to look like. This is what the whole area used to look like. There were um, wide wetlands. But this is all that's sort of left of it. And in 2004, when I went there to do this initial research, nothing had been built. It was just still in the minds of developers. They just wanted to, they dreamt of this. When I went back in 2007, they were already starting to clear these out. And I, I documented part of this. Um, there were environmental regulations that protected a lot of these sites. <coughs> But um, developers got around them by doing things like this, which is they would uh, hire fishermen to dump um, uh, these the very invasive water lily plants into it's water hyacinth. They would dump these into the, uh, the ponds. Within three seasons, they'd be overrun like this. And then soon after, they would, uh, they would compact these and fill them in. Um, building these 28, 35 story um, towers on poorly compacted alluvial soil. I just, I can't even imagine how, how dangerous this is. 
And there are many, many effects of this. I'll just say this one thing is in the last couple of years, um, you know, the, we've been experiencing bad heat here. You know, I, when we go through the, these hot spells, I don't deal well with the heat at all. And I say, oh, you know, it's, it's like India. It's nothing like India. And, you know, in Calcutta today, there are so many heat related deaths um, that are happening amongst the marginalized and the poor. Uh, and it's increased tenfold. I mean, they've had record high temperatures. As there has been all across the world this year. Um, and a lot of it has to do it in that city with an increase in uh, concrete and a decrease in uh, green space. All right, let me move on. So one thing uh, in terms of the urbanizing cities. Um, I'll move through this one somewhat quick, more quickly. Um, to talk about geopolitics. As I said before, you know, I get to Goa and I'm looking around and thinking, why are the Russians everywhere? I don't understand this. I, a man in a pool said to me, where are you from, Delhi? And I said, you know, thick Russian accent. And I said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm from the US. He said, oh, the US? And I said, well, I grew up in Canada, oh, much better, he said. <laughs> um, and I said, I said, where are you from? And he said, Singapore. Hmm. That accent really didn't match up, but okay. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about India is that throughout the Cold War, India had always been sort of pushed towards a Russian sphere of influence, mainly because the US didn't believe that it wasn't really socialist. Um, what's happening right now is really, really fascinating. There's still these long-standing ties with Russia. Um, when I began to look into you know, the Russians in Goa, it became very clear that this had become a vacation destination for a lot of Russians, in part because other parts of the Middle East were becoming more dangerous for them. Turkey was more dangerous for them. There had been fluctuations in the ruble. And there were these different sort of relationships that had emerged. But overall, India is actually moving farther away from Russia and close in some ways, in some ways not. Um, Everybody is sort of in a state of flux because, as with this country, nobody knows what is going on in the world. But what's been interesting is because um, the U.S. is trying to diminish unsuccessfully Chinese influence in the region, the U.S. is trying to build new sorts of relationships with India. And in particular, one thing you will often notice on the news today is the use of the term, term Indo-Pacific. Usually people call it Asia Pacific, not Indo Pacific. But this is a very, very clear attempt to, to, um, to create a new set of relationships. In the case of the US, a lot of that has to do with a direct set of relationships around selling military goods, um, not in some of the kind of aid or other developmental activities of the past. But in lots of ways, this aligns well with what um, domestic uh, audiences in India are interested in. When we see India today, it's usually in terms of its geopolitics, it's all about its antagonisms with Pakistan. And with good reason. India has fought four wars with Pakistan, as you know, the, the territory of Kashmir is one of the most heavily um, militarized and kind of brutal ongoing conflicts with a population that in a majority Hindu country like India is a majority Muslim state of Kashmir. It is not clear that the people of Kashmir want to um, be part of either India or Pakistan, but it's still the big time of war. India will talk about this, especially when the Hindu right is in power, especially when more kind of um, Islamic uh, political parties are in power in Pakistan. But really, India is not as concerned with Pakistan as it is with China. India and China is the big sort of um, contest in the region. Much as with uh, Pakistan, India has had many, many border disputes with China before. In 1962, one of these border disputes broke out into a war in which the Chinese army smashed through the Indian army and made it you know, 50 miles from Delhi. And India, to some degree, I would say, has never recovered from that. It's always been really anxious about what China is doing. And you'll see it play out in weird kinds of ways. When the tsunami hit, um, I remember the Indian ambassador to the US going on CNN and then saying, so you know, are you asking the US 
people to send money, and he said, no, 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 we don't need money sent to us. We just we want to be recognized for for being the strong leader regionally that we are. And in fact, before the Indian um, government even sent ships to help the south of India, they were steaming off ships to help other uh, neighboring countries. Again, it's all about China. In the last two years, there have been so many border disputes between India and Pakistan that have, you know, they both have large numbers of troops massed along these borders. This isn't a border, um, you know, you have the space between, uh, in the Kashmir, I always love the fact that Pakistan sold a part of Kashmir that they technically don't necessarily have control over to China, um, as a way of, I think, getting kept the Indians, but uh, these disputes uh, kind of go on and on. And in, this, in a similar kind of way that if you look at China today, I, mean, I think there are all kinds of things I could say about US foreign policy right now and the sort of incoherence of US foreign policy. But I think some of the things that those in charge fundamentally don't understand is that something like the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is, I'm not going to get into, I, I don't really like trade deals like this. However, the whole point of the trade deal was to counter China. And in the absence, when the US has stepped back from all sorts of different kind of leadership roles, others have jumped into that vacuum. Russia has jumped into the vacuum to some degree, but China win. If you look at China in Africa right now, if you look at China in Latin America, there is a range of different kinds of development projects, resource extraction, um, kind of bilateral trade and ties that I would have thought would have been just unthinkable even five years ago because the U.S. wouldn't have allowed China to sort of enter into its sphere of influence. But that's not what's happening. And we see this in, um, in South Asia as well. So China has been building all kinds of infrastructure in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Right? Afghanistan is even crazier. I'm not going to go into Afghanistan. But with Pakistan, so for example, China, um, the Karakoram Highway, which is the highest highway, I think it's the highest highway in the world, um, there were a couple of big, there was earthquakes and some landslides. And it, it wiped out certain parts of um, the Karakoram Highway. And the Pakistan government couldn't afford to, or they weren't getting around to rebuilding. China stepped in and, and rebuilt it on their own dime and created a whole sort of new relationship there. There's a trade link, a, a sort of, you know, the New Silk Road is a whole other sort of initiative that uh, stretches through Central Asia. But there's a trade link, um, uh, the building of port infrastructures in Pakistan by China. It's, uh, it's something that I think uh, bears a lot more attention when we don't really so lastly, the other big, big thing that I wanted to talk about is Hindu nationalism. So nationalism, as we know, is on the rise sort of everywhere, um, and especially these sorts of these notions of ethnic nationalism that countries, many of which are multi-ethnic states, are really meant for one type of person. Um, we see it in Hungary, we see it in Poland, we see the rise of these sorts of movements in Scandinavian countries, in Canada, in the US, all sorts of places, in South Africa, in Turkey, uh, and on and on. In India, this takes a particular kind of uh, root in uh, Hindu nationalism. And Hindu nationalism, it has its origins in the 19th century, and really starts as a group of elite, upper caste Hindu men who say, we want better things under the British. We don't really care about it. Um, when Gandhi joins the nationalist movement, he really transforms this in a lot of ways, and he is, as a result, despised by Hindu nationalists, and he is, in fact, assassinated by Hindu nationalists. When Gandhi is assassinated, it actually delegitimizes the Hindu nationalist movement for a long time. But then what happens under Indira Gandhi, who is not related, as India sort of careens through this early period of its democracy, and it flirts with an authoritarian state. So between 1977 and 1979, there was something called the emergency crisis, when the democratically elected government suspends civil liberties, throws a whole bunch of people in jail, 
and eventually it steps back from this. But one of the, the groups that had opposed this authoritarian regime were Hindu nationalists. So they regained um, some power. And in the uh, 1980s, they begin to get more and more popular. And what they do is they feed on the similar kinds of resentments that you see in all sorts of populist movements. I mean, the reality is that you know, populism doesn't succeed unless there are very real resentments, very real grievances that you can feed into, right? It's not, it's not, a, uh, a, um, it's not manufactured to say that um, the working classes have been disenfranchised by globalization. They have. Um, but is the response to demonize immigrants? Or is that the reason that, you know, why, why are there less coal miners? It's not environmental regulations. It's not, you know, immigrants stealing jobs. It's you had mechanization of the industry. There's other things that happen. And in a similar kind of way, uh, Hindu nationalism in the 1980s really begins to reflect the resentment of lower caste um, men and upper caste men. And they are resentful that um, as the Indian um, state starts to, and civil society starts to develop, and we start to see more rights for uh, marginalized groups, um, that they're going to get cut out of this. And so there's a lot of anxiety about that. Um, and one of the things I remember uh, in the 1980s, there was a government commission that came out and said, okay, so we have a caste-based society in India. And caste is, it doesn't map directly onto class. It divides the, the Indian society, those who are Hindu, um, although it actually extends to other religions as well. But it basically says that on the basis of your um, lineage, that's what your opportunities in life are going to be. It divides Indian society into uh, priests, warriors, um, tradespeople, servants, and those without caste. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. There, you know, so the caste background of my family is like somewhere between warrior and priests. Um, but it's like this scribe caste, basically. So you have these, you know, there's a lot of nuance in there. But the reality is still is that those who are in political power, so until this last prime minister, almost all the prime ministers in India came from the priestly caste. Um, the priestly caste and the warrior caste make up about 2 to 4 percent of the population, and they make up about 90 percent of the professional classes in terms of work. They make up the vast majority of politicians and so on. And so in the 1980s, there was a report that came out that said, we need to create an affirmative action um, uh, policy, one that is much, much more uh, that has much more teeth than what you have in the U.S. I mean, in, in most Western countries, affirmative action means if you have two people who have the same qualifications, you'll prefer one. This was a strict quota system that said we're going to reserve X number of seats in Parliament for women, X number of seats in um, uh, you know, certain professions, these kinds of things, we're going to set these aside. Huge backlash against this. And really, if you look at the Hindu nationalist movement, a lot of its kind of vigor comes from, um, from those resentments that are uh, brought up. And the other thing about Hindu nationalism that I think is most sort of alarming is how deeply rooted it is, how deeply embedded it is in Indian society today. Um, when it sort of went underground after it was delegitimized under, uh, after the Gandhi assassination, it really starts to work through civil society organizations. So it's not just a political party. It's in fact a movement that is in trade unions, in women's organizations, in student uh, groups, and all kinds of things. Um, it's deeply mistrustful of minorities in many ways. Um, the targets have been in the past Christians, um, the so-called untouchables or Dalits, um, and most notably uh, uh, Muslims. So Hindutva, which, which is the sort of expression, it's called the Hindu way. Uh, it reaches back into the 1920s um, as a more kind of organized movement. It was one that um, based itself in lots of ways on kind of fascist uh, principles of organizing. Um, but it's morphed into all sorts of new things today. So the ruling party in 
India today is something known as the BJP. Uh, and this is the, um, the leader, the, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, who was pr uh, previously the Chief Minister of the Western Indian State of Gujarat. <coughs> until recent, relatively recently, until he was elected Prime Minister, he was actually banned from entry into uh, the US. Because while he had been the Chief Minister of Gujarat, there had been a pogrom against uh, Muslims. Um, one in which uh, over 3,000 people were killed, there were mass rapes, there were all sorts of atrocities um, for which he did, not get, um, he did not intervene. And yet he has proved to be an immensely popular prime minister so far. Uh, and the BJP, the Hindu right, uh, in part in power, has been uh, also very popular. But, uh, Hindu, as I, I said before, the Hindu right extends far beyond just a political party. There are these voluntary associations, this is called the RSS, this is a, uh, a wide network of different kind of social service agencies of different kinds. Um, they go out and do all sorts of things built on, you know, being physically fit and living a Hindu way, etc. There's a worldwide um, organization uh, called the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which is a worldwide Hindu council, which advocates for sort of these Hindu ways um, and, and sort of defends Hindu nationalism abroad. Taken together, all of these different kinds of organizations are sometimes called the family of Hindu organizations. And their sort of scariest manifestation are what are known as the Bajrang Dal, the, the army of the monkey god, which is, harkens back to that first image that I showed you. These are mostly young, underemployed men um, who are at the forefront. Really, people have referred to them as brown shirts of the Hindu right movement. As I said before, their real sort of um, the fear or, that they mobilize is around militant Islam. So once again, as we see in many, many countries, uh, we focus a lot on Europe and on uh, North America, and certainly we see elements of Islamophobia there as well. But in South Asia, this is this motivates. I mean, when you think about the Rohingya uh, atrocities in Myanmar today, a lot of that is about this fear, this existential fear about radical Islam. Um, it also manifests in uh, its own versions of economic nationalism. So Hindu nationalism is all about made in India. So it's an India first kind of idea. Even while uh, those in power are very much uh, entangled within the sort of the global economy. Politically, as I said, they've become uh, incredibly dominant all across the U.S. So this is in the last state elections. This is the number of um, state governments in orange that are run by the Hindu right uh, or its allies. Um, most notably in uh, the spring, uh, almost all of those in what's called the chicken neck, the little part of uh, India that extends over Bangladesh, uh, those were mostly um, left parties and they all flipped over to Hindu right. And that was the vote share of the Hindu right in the last national election. Uh, the ones in gray are, are other parties. So when we think about India today, we see this sort of continuing trends around urban growth, uh, economic development, but at the same time growing inequality and all of the sort of negative uh, impacts of that growth. Uh, rising communal tensions, uh, especially between Muslim and Hindu populations. And yet at the same time, I thought, well, I'm not just going to leave you with that and say, well, it's just all going to hell. Um, <laughs> it is, at the same time, a really, it continues to be an incredibly vibrant and, um, and sort of active um, environment, the one in which while all of these things are going on, they are not going on unopposed. I took um, the following images just out of protests uh, that were taking place in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I said before, one of the, the ongoing sort of um, deeply, deeply problematic issues is around sexual violence. Um, and there's lots of questions about the fact that I believe the statistics around uh, sexual violence is report, reported sexual violence is up about 40% since 2015. But again, that's around, that, that's about reporting. Um, there's still estimates that, uh, that 
sexual violence is unreported 90% uh, of the time. Sorry, and, can you just yeah. explain what you mean by sexual violence? So sexual violence of different kinds, um, so cases of rape uh, and assault uh, of women and children um, throughout the country. Um, but we see, we've seen a lot of mobilizing, uh, mobilizing in many cities in the countryside um, to take on uh, the lack of prosecution of uh, those accused, the lack of accountability of police forces, um, and in fact, the complicity of police forces in some of these, the lack of adequate laws to deal with uh, issues of sexual violence. Uh, and that goes uh, on. Some of the biggest mobilizations we've seen in the last little while have been by farmers. So this is from uh, earlier this week. So there have been farmers marching on big, big cities. One of the, the, the other things I could have talked about um, is farmer suicides. It's an enormous, enormous issue in states like Andhra Pradesh, other places where these farmers are committing suicide essentially because they're getting into debt. And they're getting into huge debt to <coughs> seed companies, to fertilizers, to sort of large-scale agribusiness. But there has been a lot of mobilizing of farmers to say, we need to take this on. We need to deal with things like terminator seeds. We need to, um, we need to look at these kind of kinds of practices that put us in this position in the first place. Massive marches um, have been uh, taking place, and we've seen some really significant progress in, um, in some regards about that. And finally, um, student protests, so all across the country. And one of the big hallmarks of this um, Hindu right movement in power has been its cracking down on freedom of speech and, and especially cracking down on dissent. As I said before, because they're so interpenetrated throughout Indian society, we see, you know, on campuses there will be a student group. It's not really a student group, but it's a supposed student group on campus that will, um, you know, often assault the students who are um, trying to demonstrate for uh, freedom of speech, things like this. Uh, and yet they're still out there, still out there in the streets. And we've seen some uh, real victories. Yesterday, the Supreme Court in India um, decriminalized um, same-sex relations. Now that is a law that was passed in 1861, I believe, uh, under the British uh, rule and had never been changed. That's not entirely surprising because the Land Acquisition Act that the India used to use to <coughs> seize uh, property was the British Land Acquisition Act of 1890 as well. So India hasn't always updated these things, but it is still a notable um, gain to be recognized. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, again, there are lots of uh, detail I can give you about these different things, um, but I have no conclusion other than it's as complicated a place as I <laughs>
sort of media industries within India are really sort of, um, they're dominated by Hindi. So that's very much the, almost everyone now in school will learn Hindi in addition to whatever their other language is. I, I haven't quite caught, since I've got this in my hand, um, Pakistan, I'm confused, do you consider them a Sunni or Shiite country? It's most definitely a Sunni country. It's a Sunni country, yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, and in fact, one of the things we see quite often is a targeting of Shia in uh, Pakistan, so, um, yeah. Um, let me review. Uh, the nationalist movement got its steam uh, not from resentment of the upper classes, who have been upper classes forever, but of the favoritism that the upper classes were showing to the very lowest classes, protecting them as minorities, and that set the middle class off. Because I think that's what we saw here, very close. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's interesting. I definitely think there's an element of that. Um, I think that there has been a, a playing of the resentment by some, I mean, I would make the same argument here, is that um, you, it's not as though some of the, um, the actual policies being enacted would help the working class, um, some of the people who are the most affected by uh, what is said. But the, the language of it is simply, well, we, are, we will blame X. Um, it is not as though Dalits or, uh, I mean, it's, it's slightly different, at least when it comes to the quota system. Because in the quota system there, um, people would say, well, I am unable to attend this school because, um, because someone else is walking. And, and I thought about this a lot when we were just in India, because my, my cousin's daughter was sitting for her board exams. She wants to be a doctor. And I said, so how, you know, who do you write this with? And she said, well, I write with a group of 2,000 other students. And I said, how many spaces are there? And she said, to do the pre-med, so she had to get through, uh, there was 10,000 people who wrote the first exam. She got through that, so she got to the second one. There's 2,000 writing that. And then, I, so I said, how many spaces for pre-med? She said, 54. Oh. And I said, how many spaces for med school? She said, 12. Oh. So the actual, I mean, the pressure on the kids and their families is very real. And if you don't, I, I think about it a lot in terms of, you know, the first time I went back to India with my parents, and I saw the sort of social networks they left behind. We had a more comfortable life in a lot of ways than in Canada. And I really didn't understand, at least initially, sort of, well, why would you leave this behind? Um, and I learned later on, it was really it was perhaps less about me, but it was definitely about the opportunities that my sister would not have. Um, so, yeah. Can you say something about the environmental issues that have resulted from such rampant, unchecked growth and change? Yeah, I mean, major environmental issues, I, I, I can't even, I certainly can't cover all of them. I mean, some of them I'll, I'll say um, the waterways in India, which really are the sort of, the water, the, a water for life in India. Um, the amount of pollution is incredible. Um, and the amount of sort of disease that comes through, uh, you know, rivers being seen as cleansing and yet being polluted. And not simply, you know, people see it as, well, poor people are polluting the rivers. No, industrial pollution is polluting the rivers as much. And then, you know, people bathe in them, in the Ganges, for example. It's a holy river. I would not go anywhere near the Ganges. There is a horrifyingly, you know, uh, polluting river. But not just those kinds of issues, air quality. I actually wear a different pair of glasses when I will go to India because I know that the particulates in the air scratch up my glasses when I go to some of the more polluted cities. Now again, it's not everywhere and there are also a lot of pretty robust um, environmental movements that are trying to, to take up these questions. One of the interesting uh, dynamics I've found is you do have some more kind of Western environmentalism uh, that sort of sees nature without people. But in a place like India, you're not really going to get away from people. So even when you do 
conservation efforts, you have to really ask, well, what is the impact going to be on, on the poor people who use these, these spaces as well? Um, yeah, so it's really, really kind of fraught. I think water issues, air quality issues, um, sort of garbage and pollution. One of the other effects of a, a globalizing world is one of the big hallmarks of going to a shopping mall is getting a plastic bag. So plastic bags are a side of affluence. But then you see these, these sort of mountains of plastic uh, sort of floating everywhere because it's something that, that people want to take. So, yeah. Yes, when your recent travel in India, did uh, people ask you about what's happening in the United States? All concerns, and, and what were some of their questions, and how did you respond to those yeah, questions? So there's, there's a really interesting thing that, and you'll find this in the U.S. as well, especially if you go to, I don't know, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, or certain parts of California. It's like, so at least initially, Donald Trump was fairly popular. And the reason Donald Trump was popular was because, one, there's very much a narrative amongst South Asians, and especially Indians, especially non-Muslim Indians, of being the good kind of immigrant. That we got here the right way, we're not illegal, we're not, and most importantly, we're not Muslim. So there was this like crazy moment amongst all the, I don't even know, I can't even say the word crazy moment anymore, um, but there was this moment in the political, um, in the, election, leading up to the election, where Trump went to a Hindus for Trump fundraiser in New Jersey, in which he wore, he, he had a headdress, anyway, he had this headdress on, but it was topped off by this moment in which these Muslim terrorists came in and took hostages of the Hindu dancing girls, and then were were defeated by uh, commandos with, for some reason, lightsabers. Oh. And then, anyway, so like the, the, that sort of political theater played out a lot before. However, now, both in the fact that there have been sort of a widespread, not as much now, but right after the election, there was a number of attacks on uh, people of Indian origin. That raised um, some concerns. And then the other big one was, has been, uh, the crackdown on H-1B visas, and the fact that this current administration is cracking down much more on legal immigration, or they're trying to crack down on legal immigration more than undocumented immigration. So it's this, and you know, the, the idea that like, oh, you know, family reunification, chain migration, why would you ever want to be with your family? Yeah. Anyway, so, so there's been, there's been a, a something of a different kind of, but I, I also think that you know most of the world has this like tendency to look at the U.S. and laugh when things are going poorly, without then looking at themselves and saying like, "There's all sorts of things that one could be very critical of other places as well." So people do ask. Mostly, they just sort of say, "Is it is it true? Did this really happen?" And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so. I'm really baffled by the replication of London symbols in, in uh, India and the notion, I, I couldn't figure out why they would want to do that because that would be a symbol of the British Empire which they worked so hard to become independent from. Um, but then you said something about this being a symbol of globalization, modernity, etc. And the irony to me is that London may indeed, by the time they get it built, rebuilt in India, um, may not be the global center of economics with Brexit, et cetera. I, uh, excellent point. Yeah, no, that's very true. I mean, the, the relationship with London in Calcutta is a very interesting one because other parts of India, so when India declared independence, uh, Delhi and Bombay. Delhi kept most of its statues. Bombay sold all of them. And they sold them to Canada. I can actually go and see you know, George the whatever in Canada. But in Calcutta, it's a different thing. Calcutta was both the heart of anti-British colonialism, but also loves 
British things. <laughs> There's this massive, like the biggest tourist attraction in Calcutta is called the Victoria Memorial. This is massive sort of structure built to honor Queen Victoria, which the Japanese somehow managed to not bomb in World War II. They kept trying. I don't know how they missed it. But and you know, I see this in my own family that I had I had um, you know, great uncles and, and you know, people who were, and my, both my grandfather was very involved in the, the nationalist movement. My great grandfather was a police commissioner for the British. Um, my parents, my mother has the uh, royal wedding, like Diana wedding, on tape on VHS. <laughs> my sister is actually an official uh, royal expert. She will, she will give interviews about like, royal weddings and babies. So there's this very conflicted relationship where Calcutta has never given up certain parts of its colonial um, legacy and really has, has tried to promote it in all sorts of ways. And so I think it's that, you know, India loves cricket. Loves cricket. And so it, it, Indians cheer for, like, British soccer teams in the World Cup. So it's that very conflicted relationship. Current president uh, has trade problems with almost everybody, but he doesn't seem to have too much of a problem with uh, India. So why would that be? Oh, India got tariffed. <laughs> India did, in fact, get tariffs. But, I mean, U.S. trade with India is not particularly big. Um, I don't know that he, and I, I you know, the, the kinds of trade imbalance that the U.S. has with India is a kind of trade that I don't think he fundamentally understands, which is in <laughs> services. No, I don't think, honestly, like, I, I think he understands trade to be sort of manufactured goods. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't understand the, the sort of services part of it. That said, and I can't remember what it is that there are tariffs on. You know, he doesn't use it. And there aren't the kinds of outstanding disputes that there are with Turkey over other things where he's trying to, to do this. And as a dual citizen of Canada and the US, I mean, I will say that the, the anger over trade is much more so in, in Canada because it's a, very, it, it's a very tangible sense of a very integrated economy. The US economy is not integrated with, with India. Um, there's been some very low-level trade deals that were signed, most of them under the Clinton administration. Um, the Obama relationship ha was, was a kind of different one. The Bush relationship was actually fairly good, I think in part, again, because sort of neocons in India are all about anybody who is, you know, anti-Islam. And so that, that's always something that's <coughs> Say what's happening in Assam right now. Oh, yeah, another excellent example. So, um, in Assam, what has just happened is four million people have been have lost their citizenship. So, this is part of a bigger trend that we see. I was just talking about this with my migration class that this notion of the illegal immigrant, the unauthorized person, in so many ways pushes back against the history of human migration. You know, borders are new. Migration is not. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened in this case is these are people who have lived, have been born and raised in the state of Assam. They have never, these are mostly very poor people. They are Muslim and they speak Bengali. If you are in South Asia and you are poor and you are Muslim and you speak Bengali, everybody calls you a Bangladeshi and says you, you need to be in Bangladesh. Bangladesh doesn't want them. And so what they've been, what's happened to them is they've been rendered essentially stateless. Uh, because India, so there was a, a lawsuit um, to try and actually extend certain kinds of protections and it backfired. And basically what happened was that the government then went through and said, okay, we're gonna say that all these people are, they were originally gonna do it to 13 million people. Not a 13 million people disenfranchised like that. Um, 
But it's, yeah, it's a real sort of issue. India is always talking about building a wall between <laughs> India and Bangladesh. And um, there's always this kind of fear. The Rohingya, same thing. These are Bengalis, they're Bangladeshis. Um, so that's a, that's a common thread, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, in terms of the population breakdown, <coughs> income-wise, how much of the population is still extremely poor, living on the street, selling garbage, eating garbage? Yeah. Um, if you've ever read the, the novelist Arundhati Roy, she has a, a fantastic book called The Cost of Living. And she has this really poignant description where she says, India is like um, two trucks moving in opposite directions. You have a truck with you know, three people in it, and a truck with hundreds of people in it. And that's, um, you know, in, income inequality is rising in India as it is in much of the rest of the world. Um, I don't know the exact breakdown between uh, those, but, you know, in terms of, there are, there's enough of a differentiation that you have very poor, extremely poor, um, there's actually categories of poverty. In the same way that India has 48 different categories of slums. No. That's, that's also a British legacy that everything was categorized, but um, certainly, um, you know, most estimates would say 75% of the population um, is, falls into the, the poor category. Uh, so when people say that India has a middle class, a growing middle class, that might be 200 million. For one thing, middle class is a pretty broad and vague definition. But even if you have 200 million people in the middle class and some people in the very wealthy category in India, that means you have well over probably 1.2 billion people who are not middle class. So. Thank you. Thank you.